On November 22, 1963, America lost her innocence. This day is often seen as the chapter mark between modern American politics and the cleaner, maybe simpler times before. Every single second, every single frame of every single video or photo taken that day has been the subject of conspiracy theories, podcasts, books, and movies. It is, though it might not have had as far-reaching consequences as many of our other moments in our history, one of the most infamous and defining. When that morning began, no one knew the awful things which would happen. Nobody, at least, other than Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald, while plotting to kill John Kennedy, probably didn't know that he, himself, would be dead in a little less than 60 hours. He probably had an idea that he might not survive the next few days, but he did know that regardless of his own fate, he was going to kill Kennedy, or at least he'd try. While we don't know everything about Oswald's motives, motivations, or thoughts, or much of anything during his last 60 hours, we do know some about his life otherwise. Oswald's father died before he was born. His mother was emotionally absent and self-absorbed, too much to raise a child very well. While we don't know much on what Oswald himself thought of his childhood, we do have psychiatric records saying that Lee has to be diagnosed as, quote, personality pattern disturbance with schizoid features and passive aggressive tendencies, unquote. Lee has to be seen as an emotionally quite disturbed youngster who suffers under the impact of a really existing emotional isolation and deprivation, lack of affection, absence of family life, and rejection by a self-involved and conflicted mother. Oswald was never really able to get the care that he needed, and by age 17, after going through several different high schools, he dropped out one last time and joined the Marines. Oswald's time in the Marines was only a few years, but he learned much in that short time. He was trained as a sharpshooter, but he was only mediocre. After he shot himself in the elbow with an unauthorized gun, he was court-martialed, and then he was court-martialed a second time after he blamed a higher-up for the first court-martial and tried to fight him. A few months later, he was discharged from the Marines and put on the reserve. The reason Lee got this discharge was that he asked for it, claiming he needed to help his sick mother. Only, Lee's mother was not sick at all. In under a month, Lee was on his way to the Soviet Union. Lee was an avid communist in the height of the Red Scare, and on October 31st of 1959, he renounced his U.S. citizenship. This decision was short-lived. After living two years in the Soviet Union, Lee began to regret his decision. After marrying his girlfriend of six weeks and the birth of their child, the Oswalds moved back to the U.S. And though Lee did not love life in the USSR, he was just as much, if not more, of a communist than ever. He was arrested for disturbing the peace while handing out pro-communist, hands-off Cuba pamphlets. More disturbing than supporting a country which had gulags and concentration camps in which hundreds of thousands died in the tyrannical overthrow of the democratic, albeit corrupt, Cuban government was Oswald's attempted assassination of General Edwin Walker. Walker was a practical fascist and a rabid segregationist. Needless to say, he was not a very good man. Oswald, being the polar opposite of Walker, but little better than him, decided he would kill him. He was not successful. After firing at him through some bushes near Walker's house, he ran away and was never caught. After the failed assassination, Oswald tried fleeing to Mexico City. There, he visited both the Soviet and Cuban embassies. However, whatever he was trying to accomplish failed, and he quickly went back to Dallas after realizing the police had no suspects for the assassination. It was after his return to Dallas that Oswald was able to find a job at the Texas School Book Depository. It was from here that three world-changing shots would be fired. John Kennedy was the exact opposite of Lee Oswald. While Oswald was a coward, Kennedy was a war hero. When Oswald was troubled, Kennedy was stable and smart when Oswald was dull. Most importantly, while Oswald had been mistreated and underprivileged, all Kennedy knew was privilege. The Kennedy family has been called the closest thing to royalty other than maybe the Roosevelts in the United States. However, 
Kennedy is seen as different. Like FDR, JFK struggled with his health. This struggle seemed to ground both men, somehow letting them relate more to the average person and less to their privileged upbringings. But while FDR's illness was only disabling, Kennedy's life was almost constantly at threat. He was familiar with death. He had spent far more than his fair share of time in hospital beds and had a number of close calls. When he was young, he was athletic, but his health often got in the way of that, and after an accident while playing football in college, he was made to wear a corset-like back brace much of the time. The brace helped his excruciating back pain, which the Kennedy family hid from the public long after his death. But for all the brace helped him, it also limited him. You could imagine, having a large and tight back brace, he had trouble moving his upper body. But this was just part of Kennedy's daily life excruciating pain. The pain was only made worse during his time in World War II, and especially when the PT boat he commanded was split in two. Kendi managed to swim for well over two hours to reach land, dragging half the boat and all the men aboard with a life jacket he had tied to the boat clenched between his teeth. He saved all of the men he commanded. This won him the Medal of Honor, but it also left him with even more back pain than ever before. After returning home, he ran and won a seat in the Congress, later to the Senate, and eventually made his run for the presidency in 1960. Kennedy faced an uphill battle in this race. He was running against the popular Eisenhower's vice president, Richard Nixon. In the past eight years of Eisenhower's presidency, Nixon had become a well-known name all across the United States, and he benefited from whatever popularity Eisenhower had. Nixon was young, around Kennedy's age, but Kennedy was seen as the younger candidate, and that was not a good thing for him. Nixon was seen as young, but experienced, conservative, and all-around simple. But he was awkward. He wasn't a good campaigner. Kennedy was. Kennedy seemed almost natural on the campaign trail. This was one of Kennedy's few reasons for hope in 1960. Kennedy was seen as young, inexperienced, and a spoiled rich boy. Many also just weren't ready for a Catholic president and feared that Kennedy, being a Catholic, would give classified information to the Vatican. But after a poor debate performance by Nixon and Eisenhower snubbing him, a reporter asked him how Nixon had helped him as president, to which Eisenhower replied, If you give me a week, I might think of one. I just don't remember. Democrats and Kennedy quickly used all of these things, everything they could, to make Nixon look nervous, awkward, dishonest, and compare him with the honest, cool, and controlled Kennedy. On election day, Kennedy narrowly managed to carry the country, with the help of his nominee for vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who helped carry the South for Democrats. Kennedy won the popular vote by a little over 100,000 votes, the narrowest margin of victory since Grover Cleveland in 1884. In spite of his narrow victory, he was pulling at over 70% approval by the time he took office. Kennedy was one of the most consistently popular president. His lowest point was 57%. His highest? Nearly 80. He was an all-around popular president. When he was first running, his age was used against him. Now, it was one of his many advantages. America liked having a young first family in the White House. Everyone, virtually everyone, was just in love with the Kennedy family. Jackie, John, their four children. They were sort of the model family for the whole of the nation. Yet the Kennedy family was far from perfect. John routinely cheated on his wife, Jackie, and she wasn't much more faithful to him. But after Jackie had a tragic and failed pregnancy in August of 1963, the two were closer than ever before. The death of their newborn son had brought them all closer as a family. In the last few months of 1963, the family seemed better off than before he took office. The nation seemed better off than before he took office. Things were looking up more than they already had for both the Kennedys and the country. Kennedy, along with Johnson, would go to Texas. This trip would be, basically, him announcing his bid for a second term. Working at the Book Depository, Oswald lived just down the street, separate from his family, and often took rides from his friends to and from work, or otherwise, taxis. 
The president's upcoming visit to Dallas was the talk of the town. Nearly everyone seemed excited, and the route the president would take through town was published in local newspapers. Oswald, seeing the motorcade pass right by the book depository, saw an opportunity to make himself and his ideas famous. He was going to shoot the president. Thursday, November 21st, Oswald asked a co-worker to drive him to his wife in the suburbs so that he could pick up some curtain rods. Only, Oswald wasn't going to get curtain rods. He was grabbing his rifle. Before leaving and after seeing his wife and two children, one newborn, for the last time, he left $170 and his wedding ring on the dresser. He carried the large paper bag with his rifle inside to the depository the next morning. Once Oswald reached the depository, he piled up boxes of books behind and all around him so his co-workers could not see him or try to stop him once the shooting began. At 11.40 a.m., Kennedy, Johnson, Jackie, and Lady Bird all arrived at Dallas Airport by way of Air Force One. The Kennedys would be riding in the front of their motorcade with Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife, Nellie. Vice President Johnson and Lady Bird would be riding near the back of the motorcade. They were going to be alongside a number of Secret Service men as well as the Dallas police. The route the Kennedys would take was purposely made to be the slowest so that they could see the most people. Also, to see more people, they rode in a convertible with the top down. There were hundreds, thousands, waiting along their short, ten-mile route. Yet, hostile as some Texans were to the Kennedys, everyone seemed to love them. Every person, smiling, waving, were clearly happy to see their president. Entering Daly Plaza now, John Connolly's wife, Nellie, turned to Kennedy and said, Mr. President, they can't make you believe now that there are not some in Dallas who love and appreciate you. Can they? Kennedy replied, no, they sure can't. These were the last words the president would speak. Oswald fired the first shot around 1230. It was a miss. Most wrote it off as backfire. John Connolly was a hunter. He knew the sound of gunfire, and he knew that this was no backfire. Immediately, he turned his head around, but he saw nothing wrong. Oswald reloaded. He fired another shot. Kendi was shot through the neck and the bullet went through Connolly's seat, shooting him in the back. Immediately, Kendi's hands, both of them, went up to his throat, his fist clenched, he leaned forward. Connolly shouted, my god, they're gonna kill us all. Jackie quickly wrapped her arms around John. He had been shot, he may not survive, but there was a chance he could. What's especially tragic is that, while if any other man were shot like that, he would duck, he'd collapse or fall over. Kennedy was wearing his back brace, which kept him upright. Oswald reloaded and fired another shot. As the Kennedys passed Grassy Knoll, Kennedy was shot a second time. This time, it was fatal. The limousine quickly sped away, heading as fast as they could towards Parkland Memorial Hospital. Mrs. Kennedy, the whole car, the whole world, was in shock. Oswald quickly fled the scene, running from the depository and ditching his rifle there. He managed to make it past his boss, the police, and back to his house near downtown Dallas. There, he changed clothes. He grabbed a pistol. Leaving his house, Officer J.D. Tippett pulled alongside Oswald. After he got out of the car, Oswald shot at Tippett four times, killing him. He then ran downtown, acting suspicious. Suspicious enough for a local shop owner to call him in to the police. Oswald tried hiding in a Texas theater, playing the movie War is Hell. He was again reported to the police, this time by the ticket clerk. Minutes later, police, already on high alert, caught Oswald in the theater. Oswald at first tried pulling out his pistol. It did not fire. He then punched the officer arresting him, who then punched him back, giving him a black eye. Oswald had been captured. As the car carrying Kendi sped to Parkland Memorial Hospital, Jackie cradled John in her arms, assuring herself that he would be okay. When they reached the hospital, John was dead on arrival, though doctors tried to revive him. At 1 p.m., half an hour after the shooting, Kennedy was declared dead. I have just talked to Father Oscar Hubert of the Holy Trinity Catholic Church. He and another priest tell me that the pair of men have just administered the last rites of the Catholic Church to President Kennedy. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. 
out the president is dead. Women here in shock, some have fainted. Grown men, Secret Service men standing by the emergency room, tears streaming down their face. There's only one word to describe the picture here, and that's grief, and much of it. It's official. As of just a few moments ago, the president of the United States is dead. It was a dark day for America. Nothing could redeem this. Their young, smart president, who had been very much alive just moments before, he was now gone. There was nothing more to do. Jackie was still in shock when Vice President Johnson had them, as well as Kennedy's casket, driven to Air Force One so that he could take the oath of office and become the 36th president. When asked whether she would change out of her blood-stained dress, Mrs. Kennedy said no, that she must let them see what they have done to my husband. Kennedy's funeral was held on the 25th of November, three days after the shooting. The Kennedy family, Robert, Ted, Jackie, and their children, marched with thousands on their way to Arlington National Cemetery. Kennedy was buried there after a short funeral service. Oswald was shot two days after the assassination by nightclub owner Jack Ruby. No one really knows the full story of the assassination, and after Oswald died, there was really no hope that that ever happened. Kennedy's assassination has been the subject of all sorts of conspiracies. Everyone, from Lyndon Johnson to anyone who happened to be in the Texas area that day, had been blamed for Kennedy's murder. Most details of the assassination are controversial. Most people can't agree whether Oswald acted alone or he had help. Who even did it in the first place? Some can't even agree that Kennedy was shot. There's a reason for all this. In those rush days after Kennedy's death, much went wrong. There was a botched autopsy. Kennedy's brain was found to be stolen after his death. Not to mention that the only person, Oswald, who could ever give any sort of truth to the story was killed by a mobster. It's hard to say what the true story is, and it's likely that we'll never know a lot of these things, given that today, the 60 years since the murder. Most witnesses, most of the people who were down there in Dallas or who are involved in the investigation, are dead now. Regardless of the truth behind every small detail of that day, it's true that this was a turning point for America. She lost whatever innocence she had before. It was a turning point for the worst. For the worst. Thank <laughs> you.